Greetings YouTubers, and welcome to episode 1 of my new series, Lies That Flurfs Tell. In this episode, we're going to consider the golden oldie, gravity is just a theory, slash fantasy, slash pseudoscience. In other words, that the Einsteinian and Newtonian theories of gravity are in no way real. The most obvious point at which to start this discussion would seem to be, have there been any scientific investigations of the theory of gravity by actual scientists, you know, people who actually understand how to construct an experiment. Classically, the fact that mass attracts mass was demonstrated in the Cavendish experiment. Flat Earthers, of course, reject this result out of hand, but this rejection is based largely on their technical incompetence and theoretical ignorance. They have no idea how to identify, account for, and minimize the effect of confounding variables. And they assume that everyone else in the history of humanity is equally in they persist in this belief in universal incompetence, despite the fact that Blue Marble Science spectacularly reconstructed Cavendish's original apparatus and used it to recreate the experiment. If you're interested in this, I thoroughly recommend checking out Blue's channel. I've put links in the description. The influence of mass distribution on the acceleration of nearby objects was further demonstrated by the Shehelian experiment. The accuracy and character of Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity has been investigated many times experimentally, over a wide range of length scales and in a variety of experimental setups. The suggestion that there is no experimental validation of Newton's or Einstein's results is simply false. But flat earthers are doubtless looking for real world applications. Fortunately, we are easily able to oblige them. In the early 20th century, a Hungarian geophysicist by the name of Baron Lorand Jotvosh developed an observational instrument called the torsion balance, which could be used to measure the direction and magnitude of the gravitational gradient. He quickly realized that this instrument could be of great practical benefit in exploring for subsurface mineral deposits. Field testing of this application began in 1913, and commercial application began in 1918. In 1924, gravity gradient observations were used to locate the Nash Dome oil field in Texas. This is a practical, macroscopic, real-world example in which an entirely mechanical instrument uses gravitational effects to locate subsurface mineral deposits, something that simply cannot be done using the buoyancy density argument. Here's a close-up of the gravity gradient map used to identify the salt dome under which the oil field was found. The contours represent lines of equal gravity gradient magnitude. That magnitude is measured in yachtwash units. One yachtwash unit is 10 to the minus 9 meters per second squared per meter, or 10 to the minus 9 per second squared. So for more than 100 years now, we have been successfully, reliably, and repeatedly using gravity observations to find subsurface mineral deposits. Because of the accuracy and utility of gravimetric observations, mining companies spend significant amounts of money on having these performed. In the example shown here, the negative gravity anomaly indicates a deposit that has a significantly lower mass than the surrounding bedrock, perhaps natural gas or oil. A relevant question at this point might be, how do you measure gravity? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The techniques available to us for measuring gravity have greatly advanced since the days of Yachtbosch. Pictured here is the Lacoste FG5X gravimeter, which is capable of determining gravitational acceleration with an accuracy to within 2 by 10 to the minus 8 meters per second squared. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the operation of this instrument because I've already done a full video on it. So if you'd like to know more, there's a link in the description. In the last decade or so, cold atom gravimeters have started to come online. In these instruments, a cloud of atoms, usually rubidium or strontium, are supercooled in a magneto-optical trap, or MOT. In this process, the cloud of atoms becomes a Bose-Einstein condensate, a material in which all of the component atoms share the same wave function. The condensate is then propelled into the measurement chamber, where it is subjected to a sequence of carefully timed and calibrated Raman laser pulses. These laser pulses separate the cloud into upward and downward propagating clouds so that the wave functions of these two populations of atoms can be compared. Since the wave functions of the condensate propagate according to Schrodinger's equation, the wave functions tell us about the accelerations that both clouds experienced, and from this we can reconstruct the gravity field. In the example I'm showing here, the particular wave function concerns the transition between the 3p0 and the 1s0 electron states, which 
constitutes a form of atomic clock. In other applications, other wave functions have been used. This class of instrument is still being refined, but promises to revolutionize the entire field of gravimetry. Another relatively new instrument that has become available for observing gravity is the superconducting gravimeter. In this class of instrument, a niobium proof mass is supported by an electromagnetic field. This electromagnetic field is created and sustained by several rings of superconducting material. Any acceleration applied to the sphere will excite a compensating current in the superconducting coils, keeping the sphere in place. Recording these currents allows us to measure the strength of gravity through time. Currently, maintaining the superconducting coils required that the unit is refrigerated to less than 10 Kelvin. This requirement means that these units are not very portable, but they are extremely precise. Whatever instruments have been used in the gravity survey, once you have located a deposit, you can determine its depth using borehole gravimeters. These instruments provide yet another practical application of gravimetry. Throughout the past two decades, satellite gravimetric missions have become available. Here I have listed two examples, Goche, which used gravity gradient observations to map the static gravity field, and Grace, which uses inter-satellite range measurements. The latter is sufficiently sensitive that it can map changes in Earth's temporal gravity field and mass redistribution on Earth's surface. The methodologies involved in satellite gravimetry are sufficiently complicated that I'm not going to discuss them in detail here. Instead, let's consider a second practical application of gravity measurements, submarine warfare. Returning to our historical discussion, starting in 1923, a Dutch geophysicist by the name of Felix Vanning Menes undertook a series of voyages by submarine in which he took gravity observations. These observations greatly enhanced our understanding of ocean floor topography. This relationship would be revisited about 60 years later, but in a very different context. Pretty much everyone is aware that submarines can use active sonar to detect nearby obstructions or targets. And everyone pretty much understands how this works. The submarine sends out a sound wave and then examines the echoes of that sound wave off whatever it hit. But there are a number of problems with this technique. First of all, there are a number of geometries in which the return signal may be weak, diffuse, or very complicated to analyze. More seriously, constantly sending out sonar pings will announce your presence to every hostile ship, submarine, and hydrophone in the area. Hardly ideal if you're trying to be stealthy. This problem was obviously well understood by submarine warfare specialists, and their attention turned to trying to develop a passive system for locating underwater topography. And just like Yotvosh had 70 years earlier, they came to the conclusion that the sensitivity of gravity gradients to mass distributions made them an ideal target for analysis. And thus the field of submarine gravity gradiometry was born, providing yet another practical example in which we can use gravity to solve a real-world problem. The relationship between ocean floor bathymetry and Earth's gravitational field leads directly to our next application. Only in this instance, the observations are not made within the ocean, but of its surface. To take the example of an underwater mountain, the fact that the mountain is more massive than the water that would otherwise occupy that space provides a gravitational signal. This gravitational signal is reflected in the geometry of the water around it. It turns out that the influence of seafloor topography on the geometry of the ocean's surface is much larger than the accuracy of satellite altimetry missions. In broad strokes, these missions work by transmitting time-encoded radio signals towards Earth's surface and measuring how how long it takes the return signal to be detected by the craft. This technique has been demonstrated to be accurate over the ocean surface to within a couple of centimeters. We can thus obtain some understanding of seafloor topography by examining the geometry of the ocean surface. The advantage of this technique is that it may be conveniently applied on a global scale. In stark contrast, ocean floor sounding via sonar is very slow and expensive. To see how little of the ocean floor has been mapped via sonar, the easiest technique is to fire up Google Earth. If you zoom in over the oceans, you will quickly notice what look like snail trails. You may have even wondered what they are. Well, it turns out that these are the tracks that shipborne sonar sounding missions have taken. Now, obviously, the the shipborne sonar is higher resolution. We can see here a comparison between the gravity data on the left and the sonar data on the right. 
both for a fixed portion of the Indian Ocean. And while the sonar data is crisper, cleaner and clearer, the gravity data doesn't actually get much wrong. It isn't introducing fictitious signals, nor is it getting the magnitude of the signal completely incorrect. In fact, the sonar data seems to confirm that the gravity data does a pretty good job, considering its limitations. On a global scale, the gravity data clearly leaves the sonar data in the dust. It is vastly cheaper and more convenient to use gravity to map the ocean floor on large scales. So this might be a convenient point to draw a line under things. So to recap, in this video I presented a very brief summary of the scientific and experimental investigation of the law of gravitation, and three macroscopic real-world applications of the theory of gravity, on which people's lives and livelihoods depend. Gravimetric mineral exploration, which we have been doing for over 100 years, mapping the ocean floor, which we have been doing for over 40 years, and passively navigating submarines around seafloor obstructions, which we have been doing for at least 30 years. So the next Next time you hear a flat earther claim that gravity is only a theory, or that it has no real world verification, you will not only know that they are full of shit, but you will be able to explain exactly why. So that's where we're going to call it. Thank you very much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be discussing the next flat earth lie, plumb lines are parallel.